Welcome to our new study in the book of Revelation. Revelation speaks to our world today. Everyone knows our world is rapidly changing. Come and see how God already knew about it. You will discover it's easier to understand than you thought. Sometimes it's hard for me to remember your body. The pace of life just gets so out of hand. I try my best, but it's just never good enough. I'm reminded of how much I need to know. You are for me, you're not against me. You are with me. I'm not alone through all the darkest times and brightest days. I know. Welcome. Hey, it's really great to be back with you this week. Hope you have a few minutes to stay with us and listen. We have an action-packed, absolutely fascinating, and very intense presentation. In fact, these next three presentations are some of the most intense and fascinating stories, prophecies, truths I think you'll ever find in the book of Revelation. Uh, we're right at the center of the book. So my prayer is you will hang on, take notes, go back and study for yourselves, and more than anything, that you will enjoy all that you learn and all that you hear. I want to just thank Sherry for this fabulous picture that she has taken. Uh, you know, I, I could have a whole wall blown up with that flower on it. It is so lovely. So thank you, Sherry. That is such a lovely piece. Hope you enjoy it as well. So let's jump into our study, our series that we are, are showing right now is called Revelation Now. The subtitle is that God shares his thoughts with you. The reason we have that subtitle is that John, in the Spirit of God, is seeing and hearing and then writing down what he understands God's thoughts are. So as we study what John has written for us, we are having a personal encounter with the mind of God. We're on Revelation 13 today. The great red dragon and the beast. So hang on. It's going to get pretty intense. I hope you enjoy it. It says in verse 1, And the dragon stood on the shore of the sea. Now, we'll talk about the sea when we get to Revelation 13 or 17. But in 17, it'll help you understand what the sea means as a symbol. But in this first sentence, the dragon is awaiting the arrival of the beast he is going to give his power to. Okay, pay attention. Then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having ten horns, seven heads, and on his horns were ten diadems, as crowns, and on his heads were blasphemous names. So each one of those heads, each one of those horns represent powers and authorities and kingdoms, all have in their context blasphemy. Blasphemy is claiming to be equal or greater than God himself. Beasts always represent civil authorities and powers. Pay attention to that all the way through this section. So the seven heads would be seven political powers. Ten horns with crowns would represent ten nations. Uh, scholars in the past would say these represent the ten nations of Europe. But I just want to stress that Satan uses these civil powers to bring about his purposes on earth. Now, a beast is how God sees man's civil powers. He sees our civil authorities as beastly. But I also put this note on here. I want you to just jot down. These are also Satan's agents to do his bidding. In other words... Satan does not have a nation that is his, 
but he is free to use the empires of man to accomplish what he views are his, is his purpose on this earth. Verse 2. Now, the beast which I saw, and you want to note this, please, carefully, was like a leopard. The artist has that in this painting. His feet were like that of a bear, and if you'll notice, those are bear claws on the leopard. His mouth was like that of a lion, so that's a lion's mouth, not a leopard's. And the dragon gave him his power and great authority. So what on earth do you make of this? I, I have told you, I want to say it again, that if you want to understand this portion of the book of Revelation, you need to go back and read especially Daniel 7. So notice in verse 13, 1, it says, Then I saw a beast come up out of the sea, Daniel 7, 3, Four great beasts, each different from the others, came up out of the sea. But notice there's a leopard, a lion, a bear. Okay, are you paying attention to that? Okay. The composite beast of Revelation 13, and I created this graphic for you. On the left side of the screen where it says Revelation 13, we're introduced to a beast with the body of a leopard, the feet of a bear, and the mouth of a lion. But notice in Daniel 7, there are four beasts in reverse order. A lion, a bear, a leopard, and a beast. So going back now, in verse 6 of Revelation 13, we have a dragon that is blasphemous. We have the 42 months, which is 1260 years or days, prophetic years. We have a time times and a dividing of times, which is the same as 42 months or 1,260 days or prophetic years. And then in verse 7 of chapter 13, this beast we see will make war on the saints. And in Daniel 7, 25, the beast wears out the saints. So I want you to see the similarity of the components, that they all have the same agenda to make war on the saints of God. And by nature, they are opposed to God. Now, please listen carefully to what I'm about to say. The civil powers, viewed from God's perspective, are not the friend of the church. Nowhere in prophecy do you find the civil power as the friend of the church. It doesn't exist. So let's move on with our scripture now. Revelation 13.3. And I saw one of its heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. Now, to recognize the nature of this head, it must be both religious and political, according to Daniel's vision. It claims great religious authority, blasphemy equal to God, or acting as God on earth, and having control over civil authority. It will be an influence through more than one church, most likely many churches uniting in one purpose. This reveals the danger of a church having access to civil power. So this deadly wound that was healed, we're going to talk about that in just a moment, but I, I just want you to understand the importance of the separation of church and state. Now let's go to verse 4. They worship the dragon because he gave his authority to the beast. And they worship the beast, saying, who is like the beast, who is able to wage war with them. We'll answer that question in the future chapters in Revelation. In fact, it gives you a very clear answer. Now, this power is to grow until the end of verse history to become one of the greatest power and influences in the world. Verse 5 of chapter 13. There was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies and authority to act for 42 months was given to him. Now that's Revelation 13, 5. This beast will have a history of claiming to be equal to God. It will continue to grow and morph into religious and political influence that seeks global authority. Now remember, 42 months... 1,260 days of prophetic years of the Dark Ages was an era of political religious government 
that ended in 1798. It's called the Dark Ages, called the Medieval Era. In verse 6, we read, He opened his mouth to blaspheme God and slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. Now, to claim to be equal to God or to be his authority on earth is blasphemy. To set up a religious political power is to attempt to replace God himself, and that is a corruption of the gospel. In fact, under the painting on your screen, I, I just put a text there for us that we're coming to in the future. In Revelation 18, 4 and 5, it says, I heard another voice from heaven crying, Come out of her, my people, so that you do not participate in her sins and receive of her plagues. In other words, God calls his church out of that relationship with the beast that is part religious and part political. Revelation 13, 7. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. So the beast's early history was persecution. Any religious power that becomes a church state cannot help but to abuse that authority and will always be a persecuting power. History reveals it is always a persecuting power. And it doesn't matter the religion. It doesn't matter if it is a Hindu religion, a Muslim religion, or a Christian religion. Every single global religion that becomes a civil power persecutes those who disagree. The illicit relationship between God and human civil power is an abomination always. Notice verse 8 of chapter 13. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all whose names have not been written in the book of life belonging to the Lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. See, the future of this religious political power will grow as Satan seeks to deceive modern Christianity to embrace civil power. When the church reaches out to civil power or civil authority, reaches out to the church, we are seeing the image of the beast. It will be welcomed by Christians as a way of fulfilling their mission. But please note, they embrace political power at the loss of the Holy Spirit. Did you catch that? The church can't have human power and God's power merged together without a corruption of the gospel. If anyone has an ear, in verse 9, let him hear. If anyone is destined for captivity, to captivity he goes. If anyone kills with a sword, with the sword he must be killed. Here is the perseverance in the faith of the saints. So in verse 9, God gives John a warning for this apostasy. In fact, it's a quote almost verbatim from Jeremiah 15 too. Notice what Jeremiah wrote. <clears throat> it shall be that when they say to you, where should we go? And then you are to tell them, thus says the Lord. Those destined for death to death, those destined for the sword to sword, those destined to famine to famine, those destined to captivity for captivity. And now you understand that when John writes this, he understands. When the early church is reading the book of Revelation, they know that verse 9 and 10 are absolutely a warning from God for apostasy. The question is, are you and I hearing that warning? Revelation 13, verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb. Now this vision reminds us that at one time the earth protected the woman, Christ's church. But now a beast comes up <clears throat> out of the earth and turns against her. <coughs> at the end of that period of the 1,260 years, the medieval era, the Dark Ages. <clears throat> I have dated that from 538 to 1798. You'll see why in just a moment. 
Just prior to the end of the 1,260 prophetic years, a new political power emerges out of the earth that was a lamb-like or Christ-like nation seeking religious freedom. Now, can you think of a power that comes on the world scene in an area of the earth that is sparsely populated <clears throat> in about 1776, just before 1798? Our country was founded with the Constitution and the Bill of Rights as our authority. Those are the two horns of the authority of the beast. They seem Christ-like by giving free will, protecting individual rights, protecting freedom of religion, protecting free speech. <clears throat> I want you to understand that the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, those two authorities in America have set us apart from most all other nations. In fact, these two civil powers have made our country the most powerful nation in modern times. We have the global influence to fulfill the prophecy. And coming up out of the earth, a small populated portion of the planet at the appropriate time to accomplish the beast's purposes. Now, we are a democratic republic, but what happens if we make America a Christian republic? We become the beast bringing the final persecution. Verse 11 and 12. The beast spoke like a dragon and exercised the authority of the first beast on his behalf and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast. Now, the first beast was a merger of church and state that reigned for 1,260 years. That word made in that text is often translated on his behalf and forced the earth and its inhabitants to worship the first beast. So now we're talking religious persecution prophesied moving towards the very end of human history by this remarkable beast with those two powers of authority that engages in its connection with religion and politics together. This beast will lead the world in making an image of the beast Prophecy says this image will return, will be the return of civil power and Christianity uniting in a new civil slash religion that will eventually use force to cause us to worship the beast and face the penalty of death if refused. And this is not going to be the first time such a thing has happened. It is a repeating of previous history. It is making an image to a beast that existed for 1,260 years. Now it says, this beast whose fatal wound had been healed. I want to dig this out just a little bit for you. At the end of the civil religious experiment, it ended with the nearly the end of the French Revolution. You see, France rejected the authority of the church in its revolution at the end of the medieval period and to demonstrate their rejection, they actually imprisoned the Pope, bringing an end to the 1,260 years in 1798. That brought an end to the Dark Ages formally. Now, this new image will only look similar, but it will embrace the whole of Christianity in this new religious power. We're, we're no longer talking about the Holy Roman Empire, we're no longer talking about the kings of Europe claiming to be the head of the church or the Pope claiming to be the head of the nations, which happened during the 1,260 years of the Dark Ages. We're talking about something that looks like it and acts like it, but it is different this time because it is the whole of Christendom. It is not a particular denomination. Just let that resonate for just a moment. You see, that wound was healed. The Pope was certainly put in prison, bringing a deadly wound to that church-state reign. But then it was healed, giving it an opportunity to rise again, to be resurrected, if you would. Revelation 13, 13, And he performed great and miraculous signs, 
even causing fire to come down from heaven to earth in the full view of men. You see, this united civil religious authority will not only take over civil power, but will do so demonstrating miraculous powers. It is so powerful, it will deceive the very elect, the best of scholars politically, the best of scholars spiritually. And it will unite church and state. Remember, the overview of Revelation has a theme. Who is it you worship? Who do you worship? And Revelation tells you there is going to be a time coming in which you must choose who it is that you are going to worship. You see, fire coming down from heaven takes us back to Mount Carmel with Elijah. God sent fire down to verify and accept Elijah's offering as confirming his call to return to God. But in Revelation 13, the satanic sign in Revelation brings about a false revival and confirms the beast's power. And it will appear to be true. It will deceive nearly everyone in the world. It will embrace the power of the state with the church to accomplish its purpose. And everybody's willing to go along with it. Will you go along with it is the question. Who is it you worship becomes a profoundly significant question at the end of human history for you and I. If we're not living in it right now, it starts tomorrow. Verse 14. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. In other words, we're going to have religious leaders telling us, oh look, this is a sign from God that we are to join in and unite with our civil government to bring about a moral society. Telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. Now, I did not say the Pope was going to rise to power and rule the world, did I? I did not say that. I, I can tell you my puppies heard someone at the door, so I'm happy for them. There's three prophetic warnings of spiritual deception that Jesus gave us in Matthew 24. In verse 5, it says, For many will come in my name, claiming I am the Christ and will deceive many. In verses 11 and 12, it says, And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. And in verse 24 again, For false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect, if that were possible. Do you understand that what Jesus is saying here is being said again in Revelation chapter 13? The question is, are we paying attention? Do not let anyone deceive you in any way, in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3. For that day will not come until the rebellion occurs, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, and the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Here Paul is warning us prophetically of a human power claiming to be God himself at the end of time. Verse 14. Because of the signs he was given power to do on behalf of the first beast, he dece deceived the inhabitants of the whole earth in spite of the warnings of Christ. He ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. In verse 15, he was given power to breathe to the image of the first beast so that it could speak and cause all who refuse to worship the image to be killed. In verse 16, he causes all, both small and great and rich and poor, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. Now to fulfill this prophecy, it requires the church and the state to agree to share power. 
And I, I, I'm just going to ask you, folks, get the wax out of years and start listening to the conversation about the need for church and the government to start working together in the United States. The conversations are already happening while you and I are talking right now today. This is not something that is going to happen tomorrow. This is unfolding in real time right now. Now, it says the hand, a mark on the hand. I, I've seen so many interesting uh, interpretations. Some people put a uh, code, barcode on the hand. Uh, some people put a barcode on the forehead. Um, what one does reveals their loyalty and what one thinks. It's not a physical mark. It's a symbolic saying that all of your actions demonstrate your loyalty to the beast. On the forehead is what one thinks and what you speak reveals your lo loyalty. So it isn't a literal mark. It's symbolic of what we do and what we say as a revelation of who it is we follow. In verse 17, that no one may buy or sell except one has the mark of the beast or the number of his name. 18, here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. Man's number is six, but God created man on the sixth day, but God finished creation on the seventh day, and seven is God's number. The beast, salvation by works, church and state, worship man's tradition, worship by force, the seal of God, live by faith alone in Christ. The Holy Spirit convicts of morality. Worship the Creator God on His day, the seventh day. The creation rest. Whose mark will you have? Becomes a significant question, doesn't it? A most important question. I warn you, Revelation 13 is action-packed because it reveals by what you say and what you do where your loyalties lie. Do they rely on Jesus Christ alone? I want you to enjoy our last picture for this presentation. That is a Roosevelt elk on the north coast of California. I, I mean, he's just standing there posing for Sherry. There were about four of them. She's, she can just get like 10 feet away, and they just stand there and pose. Do you like this one, Sherry? Here, take a picture. Thank you, Sherry. It's an awesome story. But before we go... I want you to go back and read Revelation 13 carefully. I am telling you we are living in the fulfillment of that time. Are you with Jesus all the way? I wish you the richest blessings in Christ's name. You take care. Thank you for watching today. Our email address is screamingrockministries at gmail.com or drop us a note to Screaming Rock Ministries, P.O. Box 5622, Twin Falls, Idaho, 83303.